Okay, folks, welcome. This is the pregame. Pregame for Unfound on the Ground, number 21. The disappearance of Marvin Clark. As always, I show up about five minutes before so that uh, technical issues are in order. And I will get sound checks tested and so forth. But I do want to start getting... Thing. Hello, LaFord girl. And let me, while well, I'm um, as usual, let me get the disclaimers posted, which I will, as always, announce. As we get started, welcome again. If you're watching this later after it's distributed again, the pregame time here is just to get in here a little bit early and to get set up and to test the tech and to be ready for when folks show up at 8.15 p.m. Eastern Time, 7.15 p.m. Central Time, 6.15 p.m. Mountain Time, and I guess that'd be 5.15 p.m. Pacific Time. Um... Again, if you're watching this later after it's distributed, as the episode goes on, we ask that if you're uh, so inclined that you uh, like this video and uh, share it. Sharing is important. And then, of course, if you're not a subscriber to the Unfound podcast channel here on YouTube, please subscribe too. But please uh, like and share this video. We have about three minutes before we get started, and so I will, uh, another aspect of this, of course, too, is the unfoundpodcast.com, which I might as well just go ahead and post that now, which is the important uh, hub, I guess, website for the uh, Unfound podcast, of course, the main aspect of which is the um, podcast episodes. Uh, but then you have uh, an outstanding array of content uh, generation and dis distribution, led, of course, by Ed Denzel and uh, helped along by the assisting team and all the great listeners. There's the live show and some things that Ed posts on YouTube and on the website. And then, of course, for the uh, premium members through Patreon, you have the Think Tank members uh, who help out with uh, this Unfound on the Ground. Hard to believe we're at number 21. We've kept it going. Thanks to everyone. We have about two minutes till we get started. Again, this is that five-minute pregame. Pre-game, pre-game, pre-game. Again, if you uh, are so inclined, please consider liking the video. Let me get uh, make sure I'm set up with about two minutes to go. I'll go through the usual overview, introductions, reminders once we get started. We do leave this pre-game, of course, in the um, in the video when it eventually will be posted which will be, if we stay on our usual plan, at some point in September here of 2022. And so we have that. We have about a minute. And uh, I'll continue to move forward with that. Of course, then again, this is Unfound on the Ground, episode number 21, The Disappearance of Marvin Clark. And we get started in about a minute. Want to welcome everyone. I am now this time uh, back to broadcasting from where I'm at in North Dakota. So I'm in the mountain time zone again uh, during the summer with some traveling. As I was saying, I was broadcasting from an undisclosed location. But I'm back uh, in North Dakota. And so we're 
back for me back in the mountain time zone. Again, we start at 8.15 Eastern time, and it is time to start the episode here. Welcome to Unfound on the Ground number 21, The Disappearance of Marvin Clark. Let me, as always, uh, yeah, there you go, LaFord girl, Fargo the series again. And, of course, there's the movie Fargo. When people think about North Dakota, of course, they probably generally think about three things. One, well, four things. One of four things. Of course, agriculture, very cold weather, um, oil, particularly on the western side of the state, and military. Right, We have two, two areas in North Dakota that have military connections. So that would be Grand Forks, and that would be Minot, uh, for sure. Okay, so let me mention the unfoundpodcast.com. I've shared it in the chat. As folks know, since we shifted a while ago to YouTube, I try to use the chat. There you go. Yes, LaFord Girl. Yes, I love the movie as well. So we try to use, I try to use the chat to share resources, too, along the way. Uh, when this gets posted, when this... When this is distributed in September, that chat will be visible. I encourage folks to look at those resources. I try to verbally cite what I can vocally, but um, obviously we like to give backing to what we're talking about and, of course, encourage folks to do additional research. But again, theunfoundpodcast.com, that's the website for the overall framework of Unfound. Share that website, visit that website, bookmark that website. Again, if you're watching this now or you're watching that, if you're participating now or later, you're going to be seeing this after it's distributed. Please consider liking this video, sharing this video. And if you're not a subscriber to Unfound, please subscribe on YouTube. Let me go through the disclaimers, the usual, which I've posted in chat too. The Disappearance of Marvin Clark, Unfound on the Ground 21, episode 21, will be recorded, video and audio, including the text chat. Chat participation is an option for the journalistic, promotional, and and or commercial purposes of Unfound. The audio and video recording, including text chat of this digital meeting, will be distributed by Unfound. By participating in this digital meeting, you agree to give unfound permission to use the rendering of your words for journalistic, promotional, and or commercial purposes with no compensation to you from unfound, its assistants, its affiliates, its partners, etc. Kathy, hello. Welcome. So, uh, again, I'm Eric Rubowski who with Ed's good guidance and good ideas from the team and think tank members uh, facilitate, manage, whatever uh, term you want to use this, these unfound on the ground episodes. Um, I'm a a member of the unfound assisting team and I've been a guest on one episode in the past for a case. And uh, I'm primarily, my main line of work is I'm a, Communication, Associate Professor of Communication, but on the side, I do some cold case journalism. Let me give the usual disclaimer that my views tonight don't necessarily represent those of my employing university. Of course, if you want to give any disclaimers, if you're participating, please do. And again, it's good that folks are exchanging greetings in the chat. Kathy and LaFord Girl. Kathy, welcome. Everyone, welcome. Um, again, I'm back to North Dakota, so I'm not broadcasting from an undisclosed location. Um, I, for those think tank members to, who are our primary pool of participants, um, thanks to an idea from a viewer, not a think tank person, but someone I know who had, who, who watched an episode after it was distributed just from some feedback that I got from them, um, which could look different over time as I implement it. I I sent out two preliminary resources, two of which we'll mention tonight. Um, The idea I got from that person was a handout ahead of time, which I'm not against and something to consider and something even to provide later. 
But for now, I went with these preliminary resources. And of course, the usual guiding questions, which just for the sake of time, I'm going to put out all of them there early for our case, Marvin Clark, right? What do we know? What don't we know? Which we're going to start with here soon. Of course, the usual from all the things we've been discussing on Unfound on the Ground, which avenues in research or analysis would be applicable avenues? And then why is this case not more well known? This is Marvin Clark. Disappeared 1926. I'm not saying it's completely unknown. I'm not saying there's not material, but relative to it being is, is you know, various places say one of the oldest cases and even um, active cases in the United States. Um, why is it not more well known? Of course, I'm hoping, and I'm not saying it's not been covered at all, even recently. But, but, and I'm hoping through this episode and your efforts, right, what a great group we have, not just the think tank, but unfound people in general who listen to the content, um, watch the content, right? Let's share this. Let's, let's raise awareness about it. So um, I'm just going to get situated here. So um, as always, we're, when we think about what do we know, what don't we know, Obviously, we want to go with what what you know the 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 accurate information is. Obviously, there are some open question things we don't know. Um, this case is a case that, for this endeavor, um, is relatively new to me. It's not a case I was aware of until recently, as far as I could ever recall. I'm not saying I might not have run up through it at some point, but I just, it just came to one that I thought through for these episodes. And I, and I think it's one that we ought to run with. So I'm going to, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The Ford girl never heard of it. And um, I think that when for this and, and when this is out there again, I think something that uh, an impact that we can have is um, with this episode. And again, encouraging folks and myself too, you know, especially the, the NamUs and some of the other materials, share that around for sure. Yeah, Kathy, I hadn't either heard of it. So we're definitely doing, I think, a case that a lot of folks hadn't heard about. So um, when I, you know, as I always say, I'm cautious about Wikipedia. I'm not, not saying there's nothing true on it. In fact, there are many things on it that are true. Um, but, you know, as it doesn't necessarily have adequate editorial review, but for the sake of just giving it credit, as I was looking at various things, something that, that jumped out on it for me was, of course, the um, idea that, you know, much, you know, that there was DNA testing that eventually led, and we're going to talk more about this here too, okay, maybe we, we found remains of, of Clark, but uh, not the case. So, you know, as of now, the case is still open, right? So it does have a NamUs entry, uh, Marvin Alvin Clark. And so we can use the NamUs uh, along with the Report from 2018, KOIN, and, and I'll get to that in a second. But if we look on the NamUs, right, NamUs.gov, N-A-M-U-S.gov, we have uh, an entry for Marvin Alvin Clark, male, white, Caucasian, um, 1926 is um, when he disappeared. This entry was, according to NamUs, Created in 2012, the um, missing from uh, Tigard, Tigard, Oregon, T I J A R D. So, um, last date of contact of October 30th, 1926. And so we have, and I'm just for, for right now, I'm using the overview provided um, by NamUs here. Uh, Clark disappeared from Teagard, Oregon area 
He took a when he was taking a motor stage, quote unquote, as they have quotes around that, to Portland, Portland, Oregon, to presumably visit his daughter. He never arrived at his re, at her residence and was reported missing. He was partially paralyzed on his right side and was said to have a halting gait. Clark had lived in Teagard for approximately 15 years. He was also the old town marshal from Linton, Oregon, and knew the area above St. Helens Highways very well. So he was familiar with the area. He had been involved in, in obviously involved in public service. Okay. Um, because of the age of the case, you can see on the NamUs page that there, there's some limited information. Um, over time, maybe this, this will be updated. Um, had a dark suit, wire rim glasses, known to wear leather high top boots. Now, if you look on that page and you click over to images and documents, they have some, some photos. Um, okay. And then under contacts, of course, they have uh, law enforcement, uh, their um, contact information. Okay. So you can, if you're on the NamUs page, you can see case images and documents, contacts. Uh, Kathy, I have a second cousin I just met by phone on 820 who has lived in Tigard for many years. Okay, so you, through family connection there, um, have some connection to the area. Um, I'm not quite as familiar with that part of the country, so I've had to kind of get a little bit familiar with it. There is this um, from 2018 uh, story from KLIN, and it's it's right on YouTube, and I'm sharing that link now. Okay, there it is. And so um, you learn a little bit from there. Um, and so, <clears throat> so between that and the NamUs provides a lot of good information. Wikipedia too, again, I'm cautious with Wikipedia, but there are references in there, and, and we are looking at other sources. So what you, you learn in that KOIN-6, that's a CBS affiliate, Portland, Oregon, that, again, he was last see, seen at the Stage Depot, and um, obviously the case, you know, went on and on for years. It's it's one of the oldest uh, cases uh, in the missing persons cases in the country. Um you know, if you watch that report, obviously they have some some persons they've interviewed and some sources they've cited. He had a wife, Mary. They had raised four children. Um, his his uh, full name is, uh, and you see this in various sources, Marvin Alvin Clark. Although I'll have a, something to say about that a little bit later. Um, you know, in that K O I N six segment you'll see that there's a Pam Knowles uh, who is featured. She's a great great granddaughter of uh, Mr. Clark and so in 19 in the 1980s 1986 and again back to what I was seeing discussed as interesting in the Wikipedia article but the KOIN 6 story goes into this. Kathy, Oregon is beautiful, very green. I've only been to Ashland and Medford in Oregon. Okay. That's that Pacific Northwest area, which is beautiful. I've been through that just broad region, let's just say Pacific Northwest, just a few times in my life. So in this story from 20, 2018, they talk about this, 1986, there were skeletal remains found. And of course, um, the thinking was that um, maybe this was Marvin. Um, as outlined in that, that video, there were some items found that um, would place this uh, from that time. Uh, or at least from that area era of the, the, the 20th century. And of course, um, though over time, in, in uh, law enforcement, I believe it's the law enforcement person who's interviewed in there, 
says that in the police report, it was classified as suicide. And as it's reported elsewhere, Wikipedia elsewhere too, I believe that there, there may have been a gun found nearby. Uh, however, over time, as we get into 2011, um, someone from the um, state medical examination office begins to look at the situation. And then as the, um, you know, with DNA, um, there is, uh, they searched for relatives, um, you know, through 2014. And of course, Pam Knowles was someone that was found along those lines. And um, ultimately then, and, and as is described in the video by law enforcement uh, person, um, after waiting and waiting and waiting for the testing, um, the person who was, the remains that were found were determined to not be that of Marvin Clark. So then the situation was, well, it's still unsolved. Of course, certainly what jumps out is me, obviously someone who's interested in genealogy, and we're not just talking DNA there. There had to be research to find people who um, who was who were related, and I'll, I'll get to some little bit more on that in a second. Uh, as the video mentions, obviously they highlight in there that there was a name of century. Um, the family at the time posted a hundred dollar reward, right? And uh, as the one lady in the video said, as Pam said, right? Well, yeah, for that time, that's a lot. Uh, they cite some uh, older issues of the Oregonian. Uh, I have not been able to find those yet. Uh, I, that obviously, those would be things that one would want to research. The genealogy angle was was interesting for sure. Uh, but as the as the TV report says, 19, you know, from 2018, this this actually then now there's two right issues, right? What happened to Marvin and um, you know, well, who were these remains? Who were these remains? Um, now, you know, to, to whom do these remains belong in terms of who had passed? Now, that in itself would be a sort of related and I guess possible spinoff research um, that one could pursue. And of course, since 2018, one could see if there's been any progress made on even determining those remains. And I've, I've not seen anything, although frankly, I've not looked as much, but, uh, but that would, you could see how a case, right? You rule something out in terms of the case you're looking at, but now you have another question, right? For sure. And it's, it's all important. So we can see what we know, obviously what we don't know. And, and this comes up just by analysis or which mentioned in the KOIN six piece segment right? You know, what happened to Marvin? Well, he was, you know, the idea is he was going to visit the daughter in Portland. Well, he didn't show up. Was this foul play? Was this suicide? Was there some reason that he wandered off? Was there an accident? Um, right? We don't know that. That's, that's pressing with us in terms of this case. So, of course, as I'm going on here, please feel free to chime in with any interesting thought or observations as we go forth, let me mention too, and I just did some quick search on Ancestry.com. And of course, again, Ancestry.com, that's a subscription database. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't sign up, but it is a resource. Um, now with Ancestry, and you can just search find a grave on your own too, but they do have a functionality that it does search find a grave no find a grave is not a subscription paid subscription site but interestingly and, and this jumps out to me and i'm sharing the link here now for the find a grave site if you go to the memorial for some reason and i haven't been able to figure this out yet and i haven't found anywhere else that renders it this way it actually says marvin aaron clark now um Admittedly, I've not, if one were to deeply research this case, 
just like doing regular genealogy or any sort of research or research on a cold case or missing persons case, that sort of discrepancy, just side noted, that could simply be a mistake. Uh, that might be that someone found a rendering elsewhere. You can also see on that, uh, find a grave site that someone had uploaded some photos there, some folks, and the site gives credit. You can see the um, photo, um, the uh, of Clark's home in uh, Tiger Tigard, Oregon, and more. You know, pictures of him. Okay, that's interesting. Just as such. Okay, and then. So in the memorial, it gives some of the overview. It's um, talking a bit about the, basically up to the point of the DNA of those remains. Okay. So, okay, Kathy, they thought maybe the remains were Marvin's because there were old coins from 1919, et cetera, in his pockets. Absolutely. Was he known to carry a lot of money on him? That would be a great question, LaFord girl, if I were, um, you know, saying, okay, in terms of, and of course now various family members has done, as we learned in the video, right? Oh yeah, we haven't found him yet and what happened to him, but we've learned a lot. That would be something that would be interesting to note, right? Was he known to carry a lot of money on him? Right. That's a very important question. Um, so this discrepancy, okay, so is Marvin Aaron Clark a mistake? Does someone have a document? Um, you know, who knows? But that would be something I'd note. Of course, findagrave.com is a good genealogical um, resource anyway. Okay, now if you go through the, yeah, so this is a good lead in. One of the notes I'd have here is if you were doing research about him, especially if he was the town marshal in that other town or he did other things or even family members of his, right, do research more about his life. What were his tendencies? What were his accomplishments? What were his failures, right? Is there anything we don't know? Now, of course, we do know now that, right, that over time that, um, there were, you know, family members discovered, who knows what they have found. And if one were pursuing this case, you know, talking to those family members now, 2022, um, seeing if any other folks in, in media have done that recently, right? What do we know about him? Were there family letters? Were there's anything that going through the databases of newspaper and so forth now, I've gone through um, some uh, old research of newspapers, uh, Marvin Alvin Clark, Marvin Clark, Marvin A. Clark, not a lot yet with Marvin Aaron Clark, but a little. I, I've done a good bit, I won't say comprehensively, but enough to say. And then just initially when I started saying, okay, preparing for this episode, this is a case that seem, doesn't seem to be as well known as it should be. You know, there's not a ton there in terms of consistent conversation through the decades about the disappearance. Obviously, you'll see in media, especially in, you know, the 2014, around that time forward, I'm not saying there are no mentions sooner, and, and certainly in media in the 80s with those remains, and you see in the KOIN 6 where they actually have some flashback footage. And certainly it would be good if one had the opportunity to research radio and TV through the years to see if there was any revisitation of the case. Okay, through after I mean 26, right? Through the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. Uh, however, you know, for first of all, discussions about the case, if you could learn about the family, learn about him, even from before the disappearance, seeing things about him. Now, to be honest, with some quick yet efficient searches, I haven't seen a ton about him. I'm not saying it's not out there. More extensive research 
would need to be done. Right. So questions like what was he known to do? What were his successes? What were his failures? Obviously would be a, a, a matter of historical interest about sort of the forward movement of his family after his disappearance. And certainly those folks who had have done and do genealogy, whether they're related to him or not, along those lines. Yeah, thank you. That's we're just we're about resource sharing, Afford Girl. You're welcome. Thanks for picking that up, of, of recognizing that. Um, as mentioned in the KOIN6 by the law enforcement person and maybe others, is that now that this is in NamUs, now that they have the DNA, over time someone finds remains that might be Mr. Clark, right? So that's on record. Kathy, other questions. What were his habits? How far could he walk with the cane and limb? Very relevant. How often did he visit his daughter in Portland? It was 14 miles north of Tigard. Okay, that's all relevant. Again, we've talked a lot about historical context, geology, uh, genealogy, uh, culture, area. Okay, and obviously since then, things have changed in that area. So we'd have to get to know that area a lot. Okay, um, I do have here, and again, newspapers.com is a paid site. I'm not saying whether you should or shouldn't join it, but I'm using it as a resource. One can subscribe to it. Also, it's obviously connected to somehow corporate, however, connected to Ancestry, where you can get a discount, but you can still then pay more. Okay, that's all up to you. I use it as a resource. I'm just providing uh, the link anyway. Yeah, absolutely great material, both of you. Um, if you're not a member, you might be able to see the title. This is just one example of an article, 2014, The World Out of Coos Bay, Oregon, right? DNA sought to close 1926 missing persons case. You see that picture and some of that overview. And it does talk about in this article, you know, and... and, and of course, from 2014 now, maybe some others have researched this, but, you know, it does talk about sometimes when you're dealing with these older cases, um, you know, you're dealing with conflicting facts or obviously facts that are um, difficult to uh, deal with, uh, ascertain over time. Um and that's important to recognize, right? Whether it be in media or in advocacy or in academics. And we talked about that. Okay. So also too, and I just, this is just something that's, you know, again, interesting from a research standpoint. If you were doing a Google search and I'm just sharing one search string of one possible Google search. And that, of course, is more of an A. Clark, in quotes, missing, not in quotes, which, which is really interesting, right? And, and you go back to the genealogy bank, which, again, is, a, I believe, a subscription database. But they have a blog. And then you'll see there, well, this is interesting, right? There's a sort of this overview, discussion, even call for relatives, right? DNA needed to solve one of the oldest missing persons cases. And you'll see this uh, Duncan Kuhn article from June 26, 2014. So you're, you know, you go back to that 2011. So, you know, you got that timeline, 1986, those remains are found. 2011, someone at the, the Oregon State Medical Exam Office gets interested through 2014. They're looking for family in terms of DNA. You do get some some stuff about a family background in here, right? And 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 again, I'm sure there's been some ongoing research. I'm not. I'm saying this overview for its time, 2014, seems credible. Of course, things are always open for further research and refinement, especially in genealogy. Um, they mention in this article that the family reward of of a hundred bucks. Would have been about thirteen hundred dollars in today's dollars. That's twenty fourteen. Of course, it mentions in there, and I'm just quoting the article. Because of Marvin's previous profession as a marshal, 
The family feared the worst, knowing he had made enemies in his law enforcement career. Of course, that's one possibility. Okay, so obviously over time, he was not found. And the nice thing about this article for further research, right, you do have references provided, which is always helpful if you wanted to keep researching, right? So that's a resource I found through that search string. Um, and again, you're going to see a lot of discussions out there. Um, I've not yet taken any time to assess the any other, if there's been any other, uh, well, I'm going to say if. I've not taken any time to listen to any podcasts or features on this um, beyond what, for instance, the KOIN6. Um, not that that's not important and not that one shouldn't be part of a longer conversation. Um, I wanted to, to stick with the material that I had found. Obviously, based on things we've talked about in the past, what's out there, who's doing what, you know, what's accurate, <laughs> what things are arguable about the case. I would be interested in going back, continuing to research newspapers, see what else has been done in TV, radio over the years. One thing we've talked about uh, on these episodes is, right, even well-meaning people repeating inaccurate facts. Okay, I'm not seeing a lot of that with this. There, there, there may be... Maybe, obviously, there's some things that need to be corroborated. And as the one article says there, facts over time can be tough. But the core, the essence of the story seems pretty well replicated. Again, to be determined if one were doing ongoing research. Personally, I think with this, one thing that we can do is with this episode and sharing some of these links, particularly NamUs and the KOIN6, um, get the word out there about this case and, and keep up on it. Anyone else have any other thoughts, please share. Um, I, and I, and I don't want to let this other question, right? So we've talked about what we know. We obviously think about some things we don't know, obviously what happened to him more about his life, his personality, his habits, um, his family, but in terms of what happened to him, right, was it suicide? Was it foul play? Would that foul play have been tied to his work previously in law enforcement or something else? Did he wander off? Did he have an accident? Did he choose to disappear? Right? Did he choose to disappear and so forth? But I don't want to leave this other question. Why is this case not more well known? Yeah, why suicide? Now, I mentioned suicide because... Okay, that's always an unfortunate possibility. And, of course, for those remains they found in 86, as the gentleman said in the KOIN 6, okay, that police report, at least for that time, had listed suicide. Well, that's not Marvin, DNA says. So we just keep that on a list. Well, if we were to, to look at the hypothesis or theory of suicide, well, of course, then we'd have to think why, Right. So that's just on a list. I'm just putting that on a list. Um, so we don't know what happened. But something we want to think about here is why isn't this case more well known? I'm not saying it's not known. Obviously, it has some regional and national interest. Thank you, LaFord girl got that. You know, but you'd think that this case would be more well known. Uh, Kathy, for Marvin, we know little about the day he went missing. Yes. Did he have dementia? Did the bus coach wagon drop him off in the wrong spot? That's another one, right? So if he accidentally went missing, if there was some, you know, um, physical or mental intellectual uh, aspect to this, and it went to the wrong spot, right? That That's a great one to note, Kathy. But if, so, uh, and, and please, if you have those lines of thought going, please keep offering them. If you have any insights about why is this case not more well known, please share that too. I thought about this and um, I haven't been able to figure it out. Um, one could easily start a new life back then, no doubt about it. And if for some reason 
and and I, and I am relying on um, Wikipedia here. Um, it's it's indicating that his birth date is around 1852. Now, the citation they give of that is a, I don't know if that pertains to his birth date or not, but that's the, um, and that was for a longer sentence. So, a, you know, a sentence in the entry here um, from a digital journal, Toronto, Ontario, which would be Canada. And, okay, so I did use that birth date in my Ancestry.com search. I've not tried FamilySearch.org yet with this, and, of course, that's un they do require sign-up, but you don't necessarily have to pay there. Uh, and there may obviously cross over, but they might have some other resources. But I did use the uh, 18... 52 date but not but with some latitude so it some of the stuff i'm seeing on ancestry has at 1851 1852 i'd have to go through those records more closely um for sure to um that and that indicates he was these materials indicate that he was born in iowa Iowa. Again, I'd want to follow through on that more. That's from sources, uh, references on ancestry. Um, not more well known. Okay. Uh, not more, Kathy, not more well known because he was past 70. Okay. Law enforcement knew little about missing persons. I'm reminded of our discussions, of course, going back to Charlie Ross, which was earlier, as well as other discussions. If it had been a young child, much more well known. Very good point, Kathy. Uh, the Ford girl, yes, the case ticks all of the boxes. White male, seemingly law-abiding family man. You would think the case would be profiled everywhere. Good point. Hopefully after this episode and whatever other accurate, legitimate works going on out there about this case, we will raise awareness. Um, if one were to pursue this more, we've mentioned networking, networking, networking. I would certainly want to reach out to, you know, uh, folks that have been involved in the case, family members, people that have done genealogy. Again, media, 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 see what's been done, see what the gaps are. Um, obviously, if someone were deeply studying this from a journalistic point of view, obviously you'd try to make some inroads in the area, get to know the area. Boy, even if one could travel to the area. But with what was mentioned here, I believe, Kathy, um, look at maps, get to know that area, histories, right? What's changed? What was it like? Maybe even the route, uh, motor coach route and so forth. Um, for sure. Anything else? Please keep sharing. Okay. Um I also think that uh, for raising awareness about this case, of course, we know all those avenues besides this episode. I think I'm going to, you know, folks that we know that are interested in, in missing persons, cold cases, so forth. I think that the NamUs page is important. It's a great resource to share. I do like the KOIN6. Okay. Uh, Obviously, any of these other sources. You know, the Find a Grave pay, page is helpful. You know, it, it kind of goes, goes gives you a pretty good uh, overview of particularly of his life in general. Um, it, it also lists birth 1852, Iowa, USA. Um, obviously, it's this is more of a memorial because we don't have a specific grave, um, but certainly worth remembering. The Aaron, Marvin Aaron Clark's interesting to me. I would want to get to the bottom of that. If there's anything there, whether this was a mistake here, 
um, or what evidence do we ha actually have that his middle name is Elvin? Is there something that was found in some record or family record that indicates not? You obviously see Marvin A. Clark in various places. Okay, I know that if I do some other search on newspapers.com, I see some just, and again, these from 2014, um, you know, other, not a ton, but I see three actually. Marvin A. Clark, Oregon. Now, if I search Marvin Clark or Marvin Alvin Clark, okay, but certainly Marvin A. Clark, 2014, you see some um, look backs on that, okay, for sure. Um, Kathy, it doesn't sound like they've done any actual searches in Northwest Portland for Marvin. I believe his daughter was running a boarding house. Okay, interesting. Um, I'd want to know. That's a great point. What actual searches were done then to now? Obviously, at the end of the TV clip segment, they say, you know, construction worker, excavation, and I'm just sort of paraphrasing, right? Developer, right? But maybe there should be more sources. Of course, uh, so did he have a social security number? Mm, social security might not have been instituted at that point. Um, and right from SSA.gov, August 14th, Social Security Act was signed in 1935. Okay, so it would have been before that. But... It would be interesting to know what other sort of local, state, or federal government records would have been available about uh, Marvin. Okay, for sure. That's important. By the way, folks, just a reminder again, whether you're participating now or you're watching this later, if this is an episode that you like, please hit the like button. Consider sharing it when it is um, distributed and we're not quite there yet. Um, and of course, if you're not a subscriber to Unfound podcast channel on YouTube, please subscribe. But for now, please consider liking the video. Um, yeah, what, what would be the other government records at that time would be important. And yeah, what searches were done, what could be done. And then, of course, we have to add the other elements into it. Woods, you know, and, and I don't know the geography of that area well, but woods, roads, towns, water. If he did wander off, uh, what could have happened for sure? Please keep these ideas going, folks. Absolutely. Um, so publicity is important for this. I think the case itself, as folks know here, birth certificate, marriage records, census records, Ancestry.com, FamilySearch.org. Um, as I always mention, uh, the big websites are important. But um, don't forget about the state and local level databases. Now, I have spent a little bit of time. Uh, I saw some of the pictures were cited in the video um, historical society there in Oregon. I didn't, but that was those pictures, that support material it wasn't necessarily about Marvin. Through that site and some other sites so far, I really haven't found a lot about the disappearance at that level, but I'm sure then going into those things with Ancestry, FamilySearch.org, state, local databases, gathering, of course, seeing even that article I had shared from that genealogy blog, see what's known, okay, that's there, and then see what still can be found. Uh, let's see what you're saying there, Kathy. Lots of bodies of water in Oregon, rivers, Columbia River, so forth. So we can see again why geography, topography, culture, location, which then if we can know more about his personal habits, tendencies, that would be interesting. And then back to that, you know, as was mentioned, you know, did this have anything to do to his time as a marshal? you know, go through court records or newspaper articles or talk to the people that have done the genealogy. Were there any cases that he would be involved with where 
one might think that someone might take revenge for sure. So learn what we can about his life, right? He disappeared in 1926. He was born in the 1850s, right? How did he get from Iowa to, you know, uh, Oregon? And I'm sure family members have, have done this. It would be interesting from a research and journalistic standpoint and from a genealogical standpoint to just have conversation with those family members about what they've learned, right? And obviously there's people, family members and others who want the answers. And let's not forget, folks, as was mentioned in the KOIN 6, who were those other, you know, to whom did those other remains belong? And again, I haven't followed that since what I see here in 2018, but just for the sake of discussion, let's assume that, okay, here we are. That's still an open matter. Again, I've not looked into that, but we can see how with a case like this, when it's like, oh, no, it's not him. Okay, but there's still something else here. Okay. And, and again, if you have any other thoughts about, okay, Kathy, I think it's highly likely he got lost and wandered into a wooded area and perished. Very plausible. Obviously, if we were sitting down, we're thinking, okay, what are those scenarios? That's a plausible scenario, right? Uh, is it possible? Now, you'd think, okay, is it possible that some sort of, especially if he had some, some challenges uh, physically and or intellectually, did he run into some sort of con man or con woman who had a line or a story going? Right now, you think, well, with the law enforcement background, uh, he'd be more astute. But with some of the other things we've discussed, not necessarily. So is it possible that someone helped him wander off and then abandoned him and then he sort of wandered away? Or was there foul play? Right. Or could he have wandered off and even without an accident, died of natural causes? Anything else we're missing? Boy, we're covering a lot of great ground here. Right? We know he was visiting his daughter, or presumably visiting his daughter in Portland. Again, just back to the name, it's 1926, last contact, October 30th. He would be, at this point, what, 164 years of age. Okay, and I'm just, so if it's uh, 2022... Minus 1852, just double checking that. Okay, 170. So, yeah, so this, this is a little off. It's not updated. So he'd actually now be around 170 years of age. Right, 170 years of age. Just that. So 1852, right, 1852 plus 170. Yep, 20. So he'd be 170 years old at this time. Uh, was he a one-woman man? Were there any other relationships, even earlier in his life, that may have um, came back around on him in terms of somehow pertaining to this? Or was there a continuing relationship where which he did leave? Right, choose to disappear or run off with someone. Again, at that age, you think is that likely or not likely? But right, it's something that needs to be considered. Kathy, maybe he could have been attacked or conned, but more likely his remains would have been found. Don't know if they had dumpsters in 1926. Very good point. Haven't even thought of that one, Kathy. Outstanding. Um, if he was attacked. And someone disposed of that, of the remains, right? What would have been the ways, right? Were there dumpsters? Or if he wandered off and he was some, having some sort of mental or intellectual challenge, and if he climbed somewhere or got into something, right? Right, you know, that would have been an issue. Uh, LaFord, go right, Kathy. His remains would have been found if he was attacked. Most likely, unless they made sure... Things disappear. There's different, you know, even then there's different things that could have been done for sure. So uh, 
very interesting case. Um, you know, if you were to do more research, you know, you could, if you were using Google, again, I, I sent out the search string with Marvin A. Clark missing. You could use Marvin Clark missing. Uh, again, you'll see with that the discussion of this being um, one of the oldest cases in the United States and sometimes oldest active case um, there, right? Marvin Clark uh, missing. And then, of course, you could do, um, you know, Marvin Alvin Clark missing. And again, I'm using quotes for the specificity for the name. Of course, you're going to see some, some uh, overlap here. But when you're using Google and other, you know, search for um, sources and history and so forth, you have to be willing to, to try some different things. And even with the crossover and the redundancy, you have to sift through it for sure. So we don't know what happened to him. There's obviously a lot of things we don't know about his life. We do know that DNA work by 2014, well, beyond from 2011 through 2018, we have enough material, government and media, to show, of course, the remains found in 86, that those remains were not his. Um, DNA ruled that out. Kathy, we don't know his reputation in Tigard, 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 but I think he was a mayor at one time. Okay. It sounds like he was a person of means. It, de it does sound like he was someone... From what I'm seeing, uh, well-regarded and established, of course, there's always more to learn. I ha I'm surprised at this point through so far fairly efficient research that I haven't found a ton about his life, um, even from the older reports. I'm not saying there's nothing out there, but I'm not seeing as much as you would think even locally. Now, granted, there's a lot more extensive research that would need to be done. And there are things that are available. There's things that we're seeing reported. There's things, obviously, that family members have learned about. I would want to have a very good grasp of what we know, what we think we might know, and then what are those gaps about his career, court cases, again, maybe going through some of those local court records that are available to the extent that they're available, whether it's online or, boy, if someone had to go out there in person to see what sort of cases that he was involved with in terms of arrests and so forth. Also at that time, certainly, um, you know, who knows, even outside of law enforcement, were there, were there any other disputes? Okay, does anyone have – and while you're sharing final ideas – let me just go through some of the remaining, um, you know, remaining aspects here again, whether it's through the genealogy blog I sent or again, Wikipedia. Again, I'm cautious with that. But when there are uh, resources cited, again, following those, of course, I wanted to give the due credit to Wikipedia because the, you know, the, the, the DNA thing jumped out to me. We do have the NamUs and the KOIN6 story, as well as other sources. Um, so there's material there. We can see here how DNA and science uh, analysis, genealogy in general, um, obviously how we're raising a range of questions here that are very relevant about historical context, geography, location, family, his life. A lot of scenarios are possible. We're thinking about those likelihoods. As is known, you know, for me, all cases are important of missing persons. Um, but I obviously tend to have an interest in these older cases. Um, and so it, it, it's just there's a lot here that's fascinating. It, it needs to be studied. Um, we can see even just quick affiliation here. We have six minutes. Even some of the more recent cases through Unfound, right, when we have a last scene and then there are these gaps and we wonder what happened, right? Uh, again, and again, some of the ones I usually meant, you know, Cameron Remmer, okay, not exactly the same type of case, but, right, we, we, we have some, a timeline and a certain events, then sort of this gap, right? Last scene, um, 
the hotel or the hotel bar. Um, Donna Michaelanko, right? The case that I was a guest on for Ed, right? In terms of between Keefe, North Dakota and Butte, North Dakota. And okay, then you have a gap. Okay, now this is a much older case. And so obviously going back in time, certainly Donna, dis you know, Donna disappeared in the 1960s. Now we're going back to the 1920s. So a lot more to research and establish. Um, if Again, if there's anything you want to share, let me just go through the usual reminders. Don't forget about theunfoundpodcast.com for uh, all things unfound. Uh, I will um, be sure, like I did last time, and thanks to to, to Linda, who's, who's not here, but for helping me gather some of those links. I, the things we've shared tonight, I will also send out to our think tank folks and at least to the email list that I have, which is probably not current. And I'll continue to work with Ed on make sure it is at some point, at some point, at some point, uh, make sure that these are available on the data gems, but definitely getting that out there. I had posted the preliminary sources. The two I think are just worthy of sharing are the NamUs and then the KOIN6 piece from YouTube. Okay, Kathy or the Ford girl, anything else you want to uh, post or suggest here as we wind it down? Uh, great episode tonight. Fascinating case. Im important to be part of the effort to keep this going. Okay, thank you, Kathy. All right, good night. And of course, you're welcome. Um, LaFord and Kathy doing great work here. All of our think tank members, we appreciate that ongoing feedback. Uh, as I always say, right, for any of these cases, and of course, you can say with, with it being an older case, it's, it's difficult, right? Someone out there knows something or knows someone who knows something. However, yes, thank you, LaFord. Very fascinating. Your contributions were helpful. But again, even in the case of relatives and genealogy, it's important to talk to those folks. Obviously, they may not know what uh, happened, but they know information. And you never know where that information may lead, even for people who are deceased from back then, who may have known or might not have known this person who could provide insights. But let's keep that in mind. Someone out there knows something or knows someone who knows something. When we're thinking about missing persons cases, folks, keep up the great work. Thank you for participating. For those who listen to watch this episode again, please hit yes. Challenging because of the time. No doubt about it, LaFord girl, for sure. Um, lots to consider. Let's help raise awareness about the case. Again, if you uh, were watching this episode, please like, share, and subscribe, folks. Have a great week. Keep up the great work and be safe out there. Thank you. We're now ending Unfound on the Ground, number 21, The Disappearance of Marvin Clark. Thank you to those who participated and you are welcome. Be well, folks. Bye.